Good morning and good afternoon to those of you joining us from points east. Thank you for joining us on this SEG After live stream on YouTube. To stay informed about all of our live stream and video events, we invite you to subscribe to our channel. You can go ahead and do that right now. Today, we present the President's Task Force on Education, Outreach, and Engagement live stream, The Secret Science of Killer Cold Reading, a new approach. We'll be pausing throughout as we have with us interpreters Justin Maurer and Courtney Nimmersheim. Justin and Courtney are here today to translate our program into American Sign Language. They'll be switching off throughout the presentation. The presentation will begin momentarily. If you have questions that you'd like to direct to today's guests, please email pteoe at sagafter.org. That's pteoe at sagafter.org. Do send your questions. We love the interactivity. This workshop isn't intended to imply an endorsement of any individual or company by SAG-AFTRA. You may hear some brand names mentioned, um, but unless otherwise stated, the views expressed and the names used are those of the individual guests, not SAG-AFTRA, and the information is provided through the workshop for informational purposes only, may not be a su suitable substitute for applicable professional advice. You should always use good judgment in matters of branding and products and shouldn't act or refrain from acting based solely on information provided in the workshop. As a reminder, this program is being recorded and you can watch the replay right here on SAG After's YouTube channel, along with a lot more really great content. I hope you check it out. Now, please give a really warm welcome to today's host, SAG After President, Gabrielle Carteris. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing well and staying uh, healthy. So today's presentation is, I think, an incredibly important presentation. It is called The Secret Science of Killer Cold Reading, A New Approach. You know, we all have to be prepared to cold read during audition processes. It is truly the thing that can help to make or break uh, your getting a role. Some of us are really comfortable with it, while others can feel actually anxious and overwhelmed by just the prospect of having a cold reading. In either case, Having a new perspective to approach a cold read can make a difference in our performance of the material. It truly can. So before, but before I go any further, I just want to take a moment to welcome our executive vice president, Rebecca Damon. Hello, Rebecca. Hello, Gabrielle. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good afternoon. I'm so glad you're here to share this uh, presentation with us. So now I want to pre uh, present today's special guest. He's an industry expert, a master coach, Clay Banks. Clay is a former Fortune 500 business and life empowerment coach. And after a successful 18 year acting career, he founded Clay Banks Productions and Studio International, which is called CBSI, where he is the head coach and offers ongoing on camera acting classes. Clay has taught many classes for SAG AFTRA. He is a regular guest masterclass auditioning coach with the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in Hollywood. I am so excited about your presentation, Clay. I said this to you before we started. It's really meaningful that you're here today to help us. So thank you so much for being here. We're looking forward to learning more about the approach to cold readings and how we can be the best possible when coming into an audition. So thank you for being here. And thank you, Gabrielle. I want to thank you, SAG After, your team, your amazing team. Uh, there's so many that I'm just meeting right now today. And I want to welcome everyone who's viewing either live right now at time of taping, or if you're catching this later on YouTube, welcome. Glad you're here. And I'm excited to impart some information to you that, as Gabrielle mentioned, is very important. I do want to start off by saying that I was reading through the questions at the beginning of this that were coming in on the uh, on the feed and uh, one gentleman uh, I hope he's watching uh, said I don't understand the importance of cold reading I don't think it's necessary in today's market and I would write I mean it stuck with me I read that days ago and it still sticks with me and so I want to address uh, a couple of key points uh, in this talk so that I'm not going to ramble on with information about acting and, and theoretical aspects. I want to give you a couple of key tools and make a few key impacts that will really get you to understand what the working life of an actor really needs to be. And when I say working life, that doesn't mean somebody's employed you. Working life means you wake up every day as a working actor 
and you go to work on yourself. You don't squeeze it in right before something comes up. So I want to address these things. But before I do, just a little bit about me to understand why I'm going to use a lot of the vernacular that I use. I am a life empowerment coach. I was a Fortune 500 motivator for a decade, and I integrate principles into my acting training that are just so important for everybody. And now I just I don't just coach actors. I coach public speakers, influencers, pastors, lawyers, teachers, anybody that needs to present themselves and communicate their image properly, communicate their message properly. That's who I work with. I happen to work with a whole lot of actors, obviously, because we're right here in the Hollywood area. I'm, I'm SAG after, I'm a working actor, a working acting coach, but I'm a communications coach. And that's basically the key point that I would like to get across to you as an actor, that you're not just learning how to act. You're learning to become another version of human. And I like to use the phrase, superhuman and here's why now i know this phrase gets tossed around a lot and i'm in entrepreneur groups and i work with a lot a lot of other very powerful speakers and dynamic people i was actually in a conference with mark victor hansen on the ticket just a few weeks ago a lot of buzzwords are thrown out there but i want to drive them home to you so you can really understand the point of this acting and life empowerment and being a human are so just interwoven and the cool thing about acting training and developing as a true actor i don't mean just going out trying to get a job or wishing that you were famous that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about and i'm special, specifically talking to those of you that are, are true artisans of the craft that you want to get this you know what you get along the way is going to be great you're going to get your slice of the pie but that's not what you're after you're not after the slice of the pie you're after baking something really exceptional and fantastic. And in doing so, this is what happens. I wanna give you a couple of buzzwords in corporate. Big buzzword is emotional intelligence. This word has been going around, books have been written about it, talks go on about it in about the past eight, 10 years or so. Emotional IQ, emotional IQ. I was learning emotional IQ in my first acting class in the 70s before that was even a buzzword. <laughs> it's like emotional intelligence. It's like you're learning how to get in touch with your emotions, understanding your emotions as tools, not just drivers that just drive you through life. And they shouldn't do that anyway. Your emotions shouldn't drive you through life. But that our emotions are like colors to a graphic artist. They're, the emotions are in a palette within us. And we develop emotions, we learn emotions, and we learn how to mix emotions. Now, that's not something a lot of people do. We take it for granted. Another buzzword is mindfulness, and it's a big deal. Mindfulness, mindful awareness. Well, as I started going deeper into the corporate understanding of what these words were, were all about, I was like, this is acting training. Being aware of the body, being aware of the body within the environment. I mean, Viola Spolin, the grandmother of improvisation, she writes all about that. She, by the way, for those of you that don't know Viola Spolin, uh, she wrote uh, Improv for the Theater, and it's where she started training her actors through these exercises that she called theater games and imp imp improvisation, improvisational uh, exercises. And then it's grown into, obviously, an entertainment form, and whose line is it anyway, and all of that. But that's all about body awareness and awareness in the environment the environment at a molecular level and the other people and objects that are in that environment. This is mindfulness. So you have mindfulness and emotional intelligence, which is acting training. And what are people doing that are looking to, to, to read these books and to incorporate these principles? They're wanting to become super dynamic. They want to excel in their companies, in their businesses, in their lifestyles. That's what actors do. We do this without even knowing that we're doing it. We're building superhuman. You know, I'll just tell you real quick a little bit about me and, and, and answer a couple of these questions before I dive into this. I was a regular guy from Long Island. I grew up middle class, basically a regular guy, regular guy, regular family, regular stuff on Long Island. But while I was a young guy, people were kept calling me Hollywood for some reason. I had no no involvement at all with anything outside 
of just growing up as a kid, but they would call me Hollywood and I didn't know. See, this is kind of a weird prophetic thing going on. I don't know. I don't know what that's all about. But I didn't get into acting because I was afraid of it. Because in my mind, as a young guy in the 70s, for you to act, you had to read a big, thick Russian book and be really intelligent. I mean, that's, that was just my, my simple understanding of acting. And it scared me, and I wouldn't do it until I turned 18, 19. And then I started studying acting. And then my life took its journey. But here, here's, my, here's my point. My point is that it scared me because I didn't understand it. Well, what I have made a, a life practice of is taking complicated things and breaking them down and making them simple to understand. So as we got into the theoretical dynamics of acting, like where does energy come from? I mean, directors will throw this around. Where does that, I need more energy. I need more energy. I need more energy. And I've asked groups of people for decades, what does it mean when a director says, I need more energy? Oh, well, you get louder, you get bigger, you, and then a bunch of conceptual answers, like you just give it more. It's like, what does that mean? You know, well, I'm not going to talk about this, but just to give you this insight, energy comes from caring. As you care more, energy goes up. You care less, energy goes down. And care comes from focus and putting the application of value on something. The more that you value something and value it as a character, the more you can create energy within you. But here's, but that's not what I'm here to talk to you about. I want to break the cold reading process down to a science, a science of understanding how do you get better at doing this. Now, I know several of you are out there are asking questions like, um, I, I have dyslexia, I get really nervous, how do I give a killer performance when my thoughts are doing one thing? This is all acting training and it comes down to the work. So before I even drive into the scientific principles of this, it's important to understand that when you hear this word that is thrown around an awful lot in our industry, especially by coaches, you got to do the work. You got to do the work. I hear that all the time. I say it often. But what I do is I also back it up with <clears throat> what does that actually mean? Do the work. Now, here's the thing. We're living in a world right now that has more distractions than we've ever had before. My goodness, you've got a carnival sitting right here, a carnival that'll take you anywhere, entertain you, flip you around, do good things, do bad things, but it's right here and it's so easily available. And it also is highly addictive. And what has happened, and there's all kinds of university studies on this, more and more attention span, people's ability to actually stop and concentrate and be in a now moment is being diminished to the point of last report that I personally have heard, less than 8% attention span in the average American. 8%, that's like close to a gnat. I mean, that's crazy. So what does it mean to do the work? I just wanna set that precedence and then I'll give you some cool sciences. Doing the work means you gotta cut time out of your day regularly. And it needs to become sacred, sacred time that nothing else would violate. Now, we all have a tendency of doing things that keep us normal from eating to personal hygiene to even going to doctor's appointments or whatever it might be, picking up the kids at school. We do these things. That's the way the actor should think about sacred time for themselves. I call them artist adventures. And artist adventures is where an actor goes off and says for the next two hours, no cell phone, no interaction, nothing. I am nurturing my inner creative artist. I am going to go into this inner sanctum and start doing the things that I know are necessary to promote my dreams and my desires to be a craftsperson as an actor. So those things have to be done regularly. That's part of doing the work. Now, whenever you cut time out, it's kind of like quicksand is going to come in and fill those gaps. You got to fight really hard to hold on to that. And in each artist adventure, you should be working on the different dynamics. What does it mean to be a complete holistic individual? That's what we're learning to be. Well, holistic development, in my opinion, in my studies, is a healthy spirit, connection to source, a healthy soul, which is your mind, your will and your emotions, a healthy body. And then, of course, a healthy wallet, because that's the fuel that actually gets you around. Right. So. 
Those dynamics need to be nurtured. That's the work. And in doing that, there are technicalities to the craft. Okay, and I want to talk to you about the technicalities to the craft. I have interviewed casting directors for over 30 years, and I ask them almost every time the same question. What percentages of what percentage of actors coming into an audition actually are warning a callback that gets your attention? And the numbers are astounding. Now, I'm not talking stars. I'm not talking established, working, fully trained actors. I'm talking about coming about actors. And the numbers are around 85 to 87 percent don't make an impact. Think about that for a second. That's like 15 percent of people that go in out of 100, 15 are actually doing anything that the casting director is going, hey, that's pretty good. Let's call them back. That number is crazy. OK, so here's why. So I started studying this and going, why? And it goes back to analog radio. For some of you guys that know what analog radio is, instead of just pressing a button or hitting an app, we used to have to dial in a station. So you would have a dial and it would be like, hey, welcome to KWCR. And then you'd get the station. If you were off, you had to land on that station. And if you didn't land on that station, you got a mixed signal and nobody wanted a mixed signal. Well, digital came in and made sure you got the right signal because it's zeros and ones and you're not going to mess it up. You're in that signal, you're on that signal. We're going to get a, we're going to we're going to get consistency and it's we're going to hear our music or show whatever very clearly. But if we're in between that signal, like a lot of you remember driving around and going from on a road trip and going from town to town and you'd lose that station and then you'd pick up another station then you'd have both stations at the same time and then you pick that new station back up and it'd be like, whoop. well, that's what happens with actors when they train. And I wanna show you how this works. I'm gonna show you a graphic right now that I created uh, years ago to put this into perspective, okay? Now this graphic right here is where actors are at any given point in time in their talks. And if you take a look at the graphic, you're gonna see these different discs that are right there. And when you look at these discs, okay, you're gonna see at the beginning, you've got ice cold reads. All the way at the other end, you have a prepared performance. Now, there's really nothing else going on here except for this. What's an ice cold read? That's when you're picking up a piece of material for the very first time, you haven't looked at it, you're reading it and saying the lines at the same time. Now, most auditions are not handled this way, although I train tremendously in this process because when you can handle an ice cold read and not be afraid of it, the rest of it is gravy. So it's usually used for training purposes. And it's whenever you read and speak at the same time and actors, you should do this like whenever possible and not overly irritating to your friends and family. You're standing anywhere you are, you're reading anything, just read it aloud, you're training, you're working on ice cold reading. That's that first disc. The second one is cold reading. And cold reading is when you've had that opportunity to look at the material, You've got at least a chance to see it a few times over a few minutes, and now you're getting a feel for the who, what, where. What's involved with the character, the plot, who am I, what am I after, what's going on here, comedy, drama, what's happening? And now you're putting the pieces together, which can be done in about five minutes, 10 minutes. And this is where you should be ready for a cold read when you really have the skills I'm, I'm going to cover with you in the next few minutes. Now, from cold reading, you go to the next disc, and it says memorized. Now, memorize doesn't mean you just have these lines in your head. Memorized means, just like right now, if I say, what's your phone number? 1936, you know your phone number right away. Well, you should, unless you just have it on speed dial, but this is your address, your social security number. There are things that are just in you and you know that, you know them. That's where you want to be when you're performing, when you're auditioning, with, a, with when your material is at a memorized level. Now, it's that isn't easy, and this isn't a memorization teaching, but there are all kind of amazing ways for you to learn how to memorize, but you have to work at it so that the lines, are done. we don't see you going up and pulling lines. Now, the next level is character development. You're understanding the character. You're doing your scene study, your script analysis. You're going into your prepared performance, and now you're ready to go. You're showing up on set, ready, places, real speed, sound, market, doom, and you're on, and you're ready to go. Or next, please, and you're walking in that audition, and you're on. That's a prepared performance level. Okay, so there it is. That's the breakdown of where we go from the, from concept to completion. Now, if you notice, I'm sure you have, in between cold reading and memorization, 
is this really dark place called the gray zone, the pit, no man's land, the dead audition? And I'm afraid to say this is where most actors wind up in their auditioning process and why they can't get above a 50% um, closing rate on their auditions to bookings because they're nowhere, they're in between, they're in that channel that doesn't really say anything. So a question often comes up about, should I be cold read for an audition or should I be memorized? Well, you should be good and you should pull off the magic act. And the magic act is I am going to transform you from wherever you're watching me in your own office, Mr. or Mrs. Casting Director, or on your couch or in your living room, watching my performance and take you into the world that I've studied, that I've created, and I'm ready to present to you as the character in this believable situation. You know, there's an expression that it's acting believable in an imaginary situation. Over the years, I find, I've made an amendment to that. It's, it's being believable in a believable situation. So your imagination has become so strong, you actually create the truth and the reality right there for yourself first, and then the rest of us will be able to come along with you on that journey. Okay, so now when you are making a choice, whether you're gonna cold read or whether you're gonna go memorized, if you can memorize and have it be believable and you have enough time to memorize it, great. If you don't, your only alternative besides blowing it is to have fantastic cold reading skills. And this is where I'm gonna spend the remainder of my time talking to you about the science of cold reading. So now that you know that, let's take a look at what an actor does in the big picture. What are we doing? What is an actor actually doing? Well, you can get a lot of theoretical answers to that, but I'm gonna break it down for you. So if you take a look over here in the top left-hand corner of that graphic, you're gonna see it's all about story. Everything that we do is about telling story. Now you can tell bad stories, or you can tell really amazing stories. But where does a story come from and what determines whether a story is gonna be good or not? It has to do with the relationships that are involved in that story. Just like you with your own personal relationships with family members or friends. You've got people that you are way closer to and you share a more interesting story than people that you have very little involvement with. It, it's determined by the level of intimacy that we're sharing with these people and that they're sharing with us. Now, intimacy doesn't mean just getting all cozy on a Netflix night. Intimacy, if you break the word down, is into me see. Into me, I'm going to allow you to see my emotions, my emotional availability, insights into my spirit, into my soul, who I am, and I'm going to see those things in you as well. We are sharing intimacy, emotional availability, and also the most powerful of all emotions is the love and keeping love activated in everything we do. Now, that simple little diagram right there, telling an interesting story, having a strong relationship, a strong relationship through intimacy and emotional availability. Now, in this, in this, okay, where do we get intimacy and how do you develop in intimacy with a camera, with somebody you don't know? How do you do that? That comes from training. Now, when we are developing intimacy with somebody, it's going to happen more with eye contact than without having eye contact. Now, when you're cold reading and you're picking up a piece of copy and it's either in your hand or on the screen, well, so much of your attention is going to go here. And even if you're not fully memorized, the copy is still in your head. And what you're doing is you're going up and you're grabbing lines and you're pulling them down. We still see you reading and we can't see that happening. When your cold reading skills get really great, which I'm going to show you how that's done in just the next few minutes, you got to practice it. You can give a better performance level read than somebody that's off book with book in hand when you develop these skills. Now, here's how it works. This is the science behind it all. You need eye contact. So when you're cold reading with somebody, you've got to keep eye contact. And you want to be able to keep 90% of that eye contact on that other person and they should have that eye contact on you as well. That's ideally. Now, if you notice, it says in the bottom right hand corner, that's pre COVID. <laughs> because this is kind of how we're doing it today. We're looking at this little black dot on our computer or on a, on a camera. And it's like, well, how do I develop intimacy with that? 
So this is what I'm going to talk to you guys about. But the importance is whether you're doing it to a lens and the camera built into the uh, computer or an actual camera, or whether you're actually talking to a real person, you need to have that eye contact. It is so imperative. The issue with a lot of cold readers is they spend most of their time in the page. Now, with eye contact comes relatability. So are you relating more with the copy or are you relating more with the relationship? The story is in the relationship. So let's say, for example, you've got a, you've got a scene or a monologue. Monologues are, are, are notorious for this. I call them third person pieces. And a third person piece is when you're talking to somebody about another person or another situation. What tends to happen is the performer will relate more with the third person than they will with the person talking to them. Often they'll just use a dot on the wall. Oh my gosh, it just kills your performance. You don't wanna use a dot or an X on the wall. You've gotta create that person. The writer wrote the scene to take place between you and another individual or a, a group of people or an animal <laughs> or God, whatever it might be. You're, you're having this conversation with somebody or something else outside of you, not somebody or something else that you're talking about. So you've got to keep that relationship going right there between you and just for the sake of keeping the simple you and the other person. All right. Don't get lost in that. It's right here. But I got to read the copy. OK, well, this is what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about a process called the ratchet technique. Line lifting. And it's where I show you that you don't need a highlighter and you don't need to memorize lines when you develop the muscles in your face and associate the emotional recall necessary to get you to where you need to be on those lines and learning how to read those lines. I'm gonna show you how that happens right now. So let's take a look at the face, okay? I have researched the muscles in the face for years and I cannot come to one answer. So I took the lowest number. I've heard that there are 40 to 170 muscles in the human face. Wow. 40 to 170? That's like crazy. And there's six muscles in each eye. Well, I just took the lowest number and I said 40. Okay. So there's 40 numbers, there's 40 muscles in the face. And then you take a look at the eyes. There are six muscles that are in each one of the eyes. This is where the science is going to begin for you guys. So go take a look. We've got these muscles that are in our face and we've got these muscles in our eyes. I want to ask you, even those of you that go to the gym, that work on your biceps and triceps and your glutes and everything else, and of course the abs, the famous abs, how many muscles in your face do you work? And what body part do you expose to the world more than any other body part? Well, hopefully, <laughs> the face, right? It's the face. And those of you that do work out, it's the face and the forearms. Okay, so if you want to work out and you want to look good and make a strong impression, work on the muscles in your face and in your forearms. And in the summertime, and of course, ladies, shoulders. Those are the body parts that we see most often on each other. Well, let's get back to the communication, usually the face. Okay, so I want to talk to you about the face and what to do with the face and how to get the face trained so the face behaves in a manner and a way, scientifically, that you don't have to leave your cold reading up to guessing and just winging it, okay? So I'm going to take you through this process of what actually happens in training the muscles in the face. This is called the ratchet technique, the line lifting te technique. That's what I teach in my studio, uh, Claybank Studio International, and we're notorious for it. And I've gotten many, many testimonials from casting directors just going, wow, your, your actors just, they, they just cold read really well. That's because <laughs> I do everything short of beating them. Not really. But your first, my first month working with you, I am developing these muscles in your face and showing you how to continue to work on getting these muscles to work so that they become a tool for you. And, and, and it's work. But once you get the work and you come out the other end of it, you now have a trained skill, a technicality that you know will serve you. And you will pick up a piece of copy anywhere at any time and go, no problem. And you'll even be able to do it ice cold read if you continue to practice what I'm about to show you in just the next few minutes. So here's how it works. We need eye contact. Ideally, you want 90% of your eye contact on the other person and, of course, them with you. If we're working on computer, 
Okay, we got to look at that little dot. Now, some people have trouble with that little dot. I say put two arrows, cut two red arrows, put it on each side of your computer and say, look here, look here. And that'll help you to not be staring at the other person. And definitely don't stare at you. Minimalize. You got to minimize yourself on the screen. Don't pre present yourself. Don't perform with you looking down like this. Hi, how you doing? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm ready to read. Yeah, I'm ready. It's like, oh my goodness. You just, you're losing all that relatability. I'm talking to you right now. I'm right here, right down the pipe. Yeah. Right. Hi, how you doing? Right. There we go. Now the eye contact when you're working on the zoom screens, keep the keep it as level as you can guys this is the new the new uh studio you all now have a company called i inc and you own your own studio called zoom and you have this zoom room get the zoom room right make sure that everything around it is working i you can find it online i do an advanced teaching for two hours on teleconferencing power teleconferencing because i deal with a lot of speakers how do you keep this room so that it's working really well for you without having to spend a whole lot of money? Eye contact, keeping that line straight across, making sure you're looking eye to eye, keeping that contact in that position or eye to camera. Okay, now we're gonna bring in the next part, which is how do, where do I look? Do I look at the camera? Do I look at their eyes? What do I do? Okay, so to answer this question for you, when you are speaking, you want to look in the eyes. Hi, how you doing? I'm talking to you. When you are listening, you're looking for the reactions from the person on the screen. So you can read their face. You speak into the camera. You listen, looking at the face, not your face, at their face. Okay, got that? Cool. Now we're going to move on and we're going to throw in dun, 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 the nemesis. And the nemesis being what? The nemesis is the copy. All right, now what do I do? I got this piece of copy. I got to look at the camera. I got to look at the face. I don't look at myself. I got to read the lines. How do I pull this off? And you might be thinking, well, wait a second. I don't always have my copy in my hand. I have the copy on the screen an awful lot. Well, if you have the copy on the screen, then your, your setup should look something along these lines right here. Now let's take a look at where the eyes. You got the lens, you've got the image, and you've got the script. And if you see the little red arrows that are going around in the circle, that's a ballet that you have to master. And you master that by, am I looking at the script? Am I looking at the person in their eyes? Am I just looking at them? You have to understand this, which is my desire in this teaching to get you to understand the technicalities and the science of this, that there are all these dynamics that you have to put your focus on. And just like learning the choreography of a dance, you've got to learn how to do the shuffle. And the shuffle is having the copy, looking up, picking your lines up, delivering them into the lens, looking for a response, going back to your copy. Now that takes training the eyes. Now, how do you train the eyes? I have to do a screen share with you right now. And I want to show you just, uh, a technique that I've put down for you to learn three basic simple things on how to go about uh, doing all this. This first document right here is called the line lifting checklist. And what it is, these are the boxes that should be ticked off prior to you taking on any cold read. You have to put these key essentials in place. Who am I? Who is the other person? What is our relationship? Where is this thing taking place? Location is huge. You got to get out of the Zoom room and go, where is this thing taking place? And then what am I after? What is my drive? What's my intention? What, what, what is the motivation? What is it that's driving me through the performance? Okay, so this cold reading checklist is really imperative. Now, you can go back at any time and, and review this uh, teaching uh, on YouTube and pause the tape, study it, look at it, do whatever you'd like, and it'll be there and available for you. This gets coupled with the line lifting sheet, and the line lifting or the ratchet technique are two pages that break down exactly what it is that you need to do in order to do this effectively. Now, these two pages right here, 
these these nine simple steps are what it is that's going to get you to be very effective as a line lifter using this ratchet technique developing the muscles in your eyes so that they are trained so that the emotional memory is connected to the muscle and it's trained to know how to work down the page so i want to go back to this diagram again and remind you guys that there are a lot of muscles and they could be going all over the place you've got to tame these muscles through the line lifting technique in order to get you to be really effective at doing this now here's how it works what you're going to do when you get your copy is you're going to hold it in your hand as close to the camera as you possibly can you don't want to keep it off to the side. Shortest distance to between two points is going to give you your relationship. Your eyes are going to go and they're going to look at the person first. Then they're going to go down to the first line on the page. Boom. You grab your line, you go up, you deliver it to the lens. You go down, you get your next line. And what you're doing is you're slowly ratcheting your way down the page. So your eyes aren't wandering. They know what they're doing, going from the top of the page to the bottom of the page. Over time, using the line lifting technique, you will train your muscles to know that they are, well, here's how it works. On an average piece of copy, just an average piece of copy, there's anywhere between 8 to 14 lines of dialogue. Now, that is stage direction indicative, and you're not reading for Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> if you're reading for Sorgan, there'll be 280 pages of uh, lines of dialogue on one page. But there's roughly about 8 to 14 lines of actual dialogue, which half of them will be yours. You're learning what's happening is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to talk, make my relationship out here, eye contact to the person I'm talking to. I'm going to make the connection and establish relationship. I'm holding my copy right over here, close to them, but out of camera's way. Maybe it comes in a little bit. It doesn't matter. Now, I need to go down and get my line. I'm going to grab that line. I grab it. I pick up as much of that line as I can, and I come back to their eyes, and I read it. I'm glancing at their responses on the way back down, and I'm going to get my next line. I'm going to pick up as much as I can, and I'm going to come up, and I'm going to work down the page. So what's happening is my eyes are looking here, back at, the, at my principal, here, back at my principal, here, back at my principal, here, and so on. And I am ratcheting down the page. So your eyes aren't going like this. Oh, where's that line? Where's that line? Oh, where's the yellow? Where's the yellow? <laughs> the, your eyes are going, they're being trained like a martial artist to go from here to here to here to here to here to here. And then you know where you are on that page. So look at it this way. If you've never done martial arts and somebody were to say to you, let me see a martial arts move, you're going to draw off of what's ever inside you, most likely from TV or, or, or movies. You go, ha, ha, ha. And you're going to try all this crazy stuff. And anybody that knows what they're doing is going to laugh. <laughs> My producer's a martial artist. He's over there cracking up behind the camera right now. It's like, yeah, that's nonsense. But when you're a trained martial artist, because you've been in your dojo and you've been like, and so on and so on. I'm not a martial artist, but I understand how it works. Then what happens is just you've trained the muscles. So when you look at this again, your eyes have to do this dance. You need to train those eyes to go camera, top of the copy, camera, middle of the copy and so forth, working your way down to the bottom of the ca copy so that eventually you can give 90% of your attention to the camera, uh, to the uh, camera, which is the person and 10% to the copy. Now, again, that's not going to happen right away. You've got to do the work. And how do you do the work? You've got to cut time out of your day regularly. If you're a serious actor, my gosh, guys, if you're serious about doing this, you've got to cut time out of your life and dedicate it 
It's not going to happen by dreaming, wishing, hoping, and praying. You've got to put the application to the development of the skills so that you can become a craftsperson. Because once you get through all, and this is a technical explanation, the title of the, of the course is The Science. That should have given it away. Once you get the science down and you understand the technicalities, then you train and you train and you train all the hard work. When you let go, you pick up a piece of copy and you're like, oh my gosh, I get this dance. I know these dance steps. I know where to look. This isn't a question for me anymore. I got this. Your confidence level goes up and ultimately you're going to be telling a lot more effective stories. Okay, now I wanna just share one more thing with you guys. And again, if you're interested in the uh, line lifting copy, here's where this came from. This is the origin of the ratchet technique. When I first started coaching full time, I worked as an actor for almost two decades successfully. And I believe that we all have gifts that are imparted into us. And as I started getting older, I realized I was more excited about helping other people than I was about going out and landing my own work. My agent actually said, Clay, we need to sit down and talk. He said, what's up? He said, you keep moving your auditions around so you can coach people. I said, yeah, we got a little issue here, don't we? And then I retired and I realized I need to do this. And so when I went full time as a coach, I realized that my first several years in my studio coaching people, all I was doing was saying the same thing again and again about the ratchet technique. So I took years and worked with a bunch of my students and said, I want to perfect a system. And so it's this two page system called the, the ratchet technique. It is the process. Now that's what people get when they come and they work for me. Uh, they train, they train with me. I say work for me because I put them to work when they train with me their first month, they're paying for this. Now this is over a $300 teaching and I'm making it available to you guys. All you got to do is just watch the YouTube video, go back, pause it, study it, and then apply yourself 10 minutes a day, twice a day if you're serious. And within two weeks, two weeks, you will have so many of these skills down just by applying yourself to those principles. Just go back, stop the YouTube, pause it, read it, research it, study it, do whatever you need to do. Line lifting ratchet technique. Page one and two, eight to 10 minutes a day, twice a day for two weeks. Get a solid foundation of cold reading and your confidence will soar and you will thank yourselves again and again and again. Now I wanna show you one last little slide about something that I, um, I studied out and I drew um, what I call the pyramid of C's. And the pyramid of C's puts together what I see that's going on in the entertainment industry. And this is what it looks like. <clears throat> Way at the bottom, you're going to see lip service, which is a lot of people going, chattering, talking, they're curious about the craft, they're saying they're an actor, they're not doing anything about it, they're reading, you know, maybe reading a book or looking at YouTube videos or whatever, but they're not really doing anything about it. <clears throat> then the next level is the crowd. And that's where people are talking about it they're dreaming about it, but they're actually moving towards doing something. They're on the online services. They, maybe they're moving and they're coming to New York or, or, or LA or whatever major market it is, uh, Atlanta, and they're actually now part of the crowd, but they're not really competition because they're not studying and they have nothing to compete with. And cute only goes so far in Hollywood, right? Well, now you start studying. You guys that are watching this right now, at point of taping or where, whenever, wherever you're watching this. You're studying, you start applying, you start taking it serious and realizing there's an art craft and technicality to everything that happens here. And you're learning to develop your art, your craft and your technicality. Now you're considered. But once you get the audition, you're still not really in the competition because the competition comes in when you're getting called back. Now the competition starts. Now we've narrowed the pack down to the competition. You and a handful of other people doing a great job. Now you got to show your goods till you get cast 
Now you've done it and you're on your way. Congratulations. And you have made it to the booking. <laughs> so therein lies the science of cold reading, ratchet technique and line lifting. And um, guys, like I say, study it, take it serious. The competition, <laughs> they said competition's heavy in Hollywood. No, the crowd is heavy. There's a lot of clutter. The competition happens as you work up the pyramid and you get trained and you're applying, training and applying, training and applying and learning the technicalities. I've seen so many great actors that have come out of celebrity acting studios and they come in here, they don't have technical skills. Guys, I'm a director, I'm a filmmaker. When I'm looking at talent, I gotta go, is this person a solution or are they a problem? Are they ready to be directed and redirected or do they need to go back into their acting training? You want solution. You want people that understand how to work with eye contact, how to handle themselves on set. You got to get past the gatekeepers, which are the casting directors, which have hawk eyes, fast shutter speeds, taking a lot of pictures, formulating decisions before you even know what's going on. When your technicalities are in place and your art is activated, bam, nothing can stop you your will, your drive, your ambition. Now you have craft and you're a crafted actor. And that's ultimately what I believe really good filmmakers are looking for. And I trust, I trust that you will walk away with a lot from this talk. I think this is fabulous. I'm definitely, I've been taking notes the whole time. I think this is wonderful. And I think particularly during a time when we're going, our industry is changing, right? We're not just in the audition room where cold readings can be, I mean, definitely are important, but also the idea of your training us how to do it when we're doing on the computer. Because again, you know, the pandemic has actually shifted and sped up a process that we've been introduced to. And this is, so I think it was inevitable, just perfect. And one of the things I loved when you were talking about it, uh, the cold reading, um, I know that if you can get this technique down, actually it builds confidence with confidence. Like you were talking, it makes you more relaxed. And if you're more relaxed, you'll be more creative. So I love this. I really, really appreciate it. And we do have questions. I want to get to uh, those questions. And Rebecca, why don't you start with the first question? Sure. Happy to do that. We have somebody that returned to acting after 25 years. Uh, they've always been terrified of cold readings because they're dyslexic. Uh, now that they're older, they're not able to rely on, you know, their uh, photographic memory. Do you have any techniques that you can suggest for people who uh, might be dyslexic or have other challenges in that space? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to keep it very succinct and to the point. First of all, everything that I just talked about, yes, it will, it, it will develop emotional memory with the facial muscles in, in, in within you and by re re repeating the process repeating the process you'll train yourself so it will actually you'll start to in, in kinesthesiology your kinesthetics will override that in, in impairment to a certain degree so this process that i just went through number one and two is is imagery mental imagery when you can associate icons and pictures to the words, it's going to bypass that, that impediment that, that uh, dyslexics uh, deal with because now you're seeing things in pictures and you're associating the words to the actual imagery. This is how Tom Cruise overcame it because he's, he's a severe dyslexic. He almost quit because he couldn't, he couldn't get lines right. And he, he figured it out and he attributes a lot of it to mental imagery. Thank you. That's great. Um, so another question that came in is to move or not to move. You know, that is difficult here. We are in front of a camera almost locked in into this universe. So this person says one casting director told me to stand in one place. Do not rock around. However, both a great cameraman and an actor told me to move true to the scene. So what do I do? What do you say? It's a brilliant question. Thank you, Gabriel. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> interest is what we're looking for we don't want to, we're not going to be cute well built classy charming you have to be interesting you can have all that and not be interesting you can have none of it and be interesting 
Interesting is what we want to become. And interest comes from information and movement. That's how you go from a standard te definition TV to a high definition to 4K to 8K. You're packing more movement and more information in a smaller space. That's what an on-camera actor needs to be able to do. So you don't freeze. You don't want to get this thing so close. I work with some actors, they put ECUs on their Zoom frames. You're too, you're too locked in. You have to open yourself up to some degree, and then you need to learn how to work in a smaller confined space so that your movements are very subtle. So if I'm going to look over and see somebody over there, I see somebody over there and I come back. If I hear something, I hear something there and I come back. I'm not going to be doing this, but that comes from training of getting the big regular person movements into the on-camera movements of the working on-camera trained actor. Can I ask you a question, Clay? Because when you're talking about the look over here, over there, again, there's sometimes people can be too broad. You don't want to go over here or there. Would you recommend even putting tape on both sides of your computer or have a, have a marked place so that when you're making a reference, you always go to that same place? Yeah, that's brilliant. That's actually brilliant. Uh, you can take snapshots. You can take screenshots. You can set your, your, your positions. You can look. You should do that to know, hey, is this a good look? Is that a good look? Is this too far? Is that not? Is this up? And you keep adjusting it. Again, the actors have to do the work to get these rooms. This is the new normal. This is our studio. This is the casting office. And the actor is now not just the actor. The actor is the DP. The actor is the cinematographer. The actor is the camera operator. The actor now has to be responsible for knowing all these things so that they do understand what's their best side and what looks work really well for them. And I'll give you one, one example. If you're auditioning in an automobile, okay, and you're in America and you're driving the car, do, the, do it like this. It's gonna convey that if you're the passenger, do it like this. If you're in Europe or Australia, flip it, <laughs> you know, convey it, sell the magic show. And of course, now I can't elevate this desk, but I have elevated desks and I'm in my studio here and we have different places because I have a bunch of things going on. But you, you want to be able to stand in certain auditions and be able to keep that camera angle at the right place when you're standing. Don't just get stuck in this place. And then one more little thing on your computer or on your app. Every hour, stand up, move around, keep the body moving. Always keep the body, not during your read or performance, but I'm saying just don't get stuck into this position. So yeah, that's a brilliant, brilliant idea. Having markers in your environment where you know not to look past. Thank you. Okay, uh, Rebecca. Yeah, we have a question about best advice when you handle a flub blind, keep going, start over, what's better? A flub line is only a flub line to the actor who should not be judging the character. The character can make flubs. <laughs> Don't make a big deal out of flubs. There are no flubs. The flub is not the problem. What's the problem is the moment after the flub. So if you flub and you go, oh, now you're in panic mode and you freaked out, well, you just blew it. If you flub and you bounce through it, you're fine. You just and, and do your best to camouflage it and make it part of the actor's movement. So sometimes I'll be stuck for a line and I'll just. Well, that's just the way he looked at it. You know, you, you just make it work. So just like improvisational training is huge, that helps you with all of this, your ability to act impromptu in the moment. So the minute you feel yourself stumbling, bumbling, going off track. You recognize it. You're the actor unactify back into the character keep it corrected and here's one way to think about that when you're driving your car and you're getting distracted and you realize you're going a little bit off the line what do you do you correct you go off you just correct you don't freak out make a big deal about it even if you hear those D -d 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 correct <laughs> and continue on with the journey very good um, I'm going to this question I, and I relate to this, but I, I actually found a solution, but I'd love to hear yours. Um, I need reading glasses for a cold read, but they aren't always appropriate for the character. I don't want my need for them in the audition room to take away from the casting director seeing me in the role. When I'm off book, I don't need them. What should I do? I deal with the same situation. It's tough for me to be a bad guy when I'm wearing these glasses. 
but I need them to see and to read. So what do you do? Real, real easy, simple answer, and it's not very expensive. One contact lens for reading. And you put it in the eye that you are reading with, and your mind will eventually acclimate to it. And so whenever you go in for an audition or what, wherever you, you have to read and perform, you, you, you just pop in one reading contact lens, get used to it. And now one eye can read and you can see and voila, you're done. Next. <laughs> Very good. I also, another recommendation I have because I have to wear my glasses. And so I also want to take them off. That's a great technique. Also enlarge your print. I mean, you have to remember nobody's seeing your, I, I rewrite all my scripts. So it looks like they're one inch letters for me, but I literally, it allows me to see more comfortably. And so that's just a, that's an option. So thank you for that. Cause I know it's really Oh, thank you, Gabrielle. I, I I got that one now. I just I just got that from you. Enlarge the print. That's awesome. Really enlarge. That's the best thing about the computer. Instead of looking at it as an enemy, right? What are the things we can do to really use it to our advantage? So, and I thought your idea of putting it right up there, the script on the screen, sharing it with the person you're reading is also a really great uh, technique. Rebecca. Yeah, we're almost out of time. So uh, this is a great one. Uh, I don't feel nervous during the cold raids, but my hand holding the sides always shakes. What advice do you have to help keep that in check? Yeah, the the appendages become amplifiers to the emotion. So when you're, what's the end of the amplifier? Oh, look at that. So even earrings, earrings that dangly, don't wear dangly earrings because they just amplify and exasperate, exacerbate everything that's going on. Um, you Breathing, breathing is huge. Breathing in preparation, first of all, I know this sounds like this is a cop out answer, but it's not. Actors really, and I, I teach this holistically in, in, in my empowerment training, meditation and breathing, it's nothing spiritual about it. It has to do with focusing and slowing down the chatter of the mind, calming yourself, getting into diaphragmatic breathing that allows you to bring in more oxygen into your body, let the toxins out at a greater volume. Getting into breathing on a regular basis is huge. So that's first, but great. I'm still in the audition and I noticed right now, what do I do? Okay, so what you do is inside your shoes, you want to hammer down your toes. You hammer them down in your shoes. Even if you're wearing sandals, people aren't gonna see that. And if you're doing Zoom, they're definitely not gonna see it. So if you're standing, you hammer your feet into the ground, you contract uh, your, your core and you breathe and you welcome the energy because it's not nerves nerves are what the mind says the energy is doing it's just misconstrued mis thought i have i have a two-hour teaching on nerves fear and anxiety it's out there you, you you can look for it that that talks about how to ground yourself and handle nerves fear and anxiety like the instrument needs to be grounded then if you need to lean against something if there's a chair grab it and it acts as a ground for you if you can lean your, your your hip against something, lean your hip against it. Something to get the energy off of your hand, breathing it into other places in your body, ultimately shooting it through the ground of your feet and into the floor. I love that. And I love that you have a nerves, fear, and anxiety, which I think techniques actually help to break through that. But I think the idea that you have a two-hour program on it, again, something I'm very interested in. Clay, this was a great, great presentation, really meaningful. And I'm so bummed, but we are at the end. So thank you for being here, answering our members' questions for your really, again, insightful presentation. So appreciated. On behalf of the team here at SAG-AFTRA, we want to thank all of you for taking the time out to be with us today. It's been a true pleasure having you here. Special thanks to each of you who have been tuning in each and every week for our President's Task Force on Education Outreach and engagement live streams. If you have ideas or topics that you would like to see covered, please email pteoe at sagafter.org. That's pteoe at sagafter.org. Again, as Clay mentioned, this is on the YouTube site. So if you want to go and be able to review this again or look at the sheets that he has um, uh, provided, please go to the YouTube site and you can see this uh, program again. If you haven't already, while you're here, just subscribe to SAG After's YouTube channel to get updates on the great content that we've been posting. Thank you again, everybody. And have a beautiful, beautiful day. Clay, again, thank you for everything. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.